Welcome back to Creation Magazine Live and in this segment we're going to be talking about geologic catastrophe and this is one of those interesting articles in Creation Magazine where we interview uh, either a scientist or a theo theologian and uh, someone that uh, has some expertise to actually uh, show uh, people that the Bible can be trusted. And right, uh, and that there's so many interviews in, in the magazines, um, often with someone involved in science who doesn't right. believe in evolution, doesn't believe in millions of years. Now this one's a little bit different. It interviews a, 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 actually a well-known creationist, Dr. Steve Austin, yep. and this is from the 32-2 uh, uh, issue of the magazine, and this is Taz Walker interviewing Steve Austin. Tasman Walker is one of our geologists from our uh, our Brisbane, Australia office, and uh, the so article two goes two geologists on. yakking back. Two, and forth. two, two geologists. That's right. I, I'm, I've had the opportunity to go whitewater rafting through Grand Canyon with uh, with Dr. Steve Austin mm -hmm. and uh, over to Israel. We looked at some of the geology there. So um, so I, I appreciate this article because I've uh, uh, um, been on some some expeditions, field trips with uh, with Dr. Austin. Geologist Dr. S Dr. Stephen A. Austin has rafted through the Grand Canyon, helicoptered into Mount St. Helens volcano, and flown into glaciers in Alaska. He's currently senior research scientist with the Institute for Creation Research, where he has worked for over 37 years. His geological adventures have taken him high into the Sierra Nevada, deep underground into coal mines, over plateaus, through deserts, beneath the ocean. For as long as I can remember, Steve has loved rocks. And, and th this is now Steve speaking. I saw my first geologic map when I was three. My dad took me, my dad often took me fishing, which meant going over mountain ridges where I saw a lot of rocks. Before I could read, I was classifying minerals, and by five, I had a large rock collection. <laughs> this guy loves rocks. I could tell you stories when we went to Israel about how much he loves rocks. Uh, Mount St. Helens and geologic catastrophe, this next section's uh, titled. Steve is known for his remarkable research at the Mount St. Helens volcano in Washington State, USA, which erupted catastrophically in May 1980. I had just defended my PhD thesis at Penn State University on, on a floating log map model for the origin of Kentucky coal beds, mm -hmm. which means the coal deposits formed much faster than traditionally believed. The Mount, uh, Mount St. Helens exploded 10 months later and made Spirit Lake into a giant bathtub covered with floating logs. That's why I had to go there, Steve says. What he saw was overwhelming. It happened at the right place and in the right time, Steve said. The volcano was so well monitored that it was, impo it was indisputable what catastrophic processes do to a landscape, uh, landscape in super quick time. Steve sees Mount St. Helens as having application to geologic features elsewhere, Yellowstone National Park, petrified forests, coal layers, and Grand Canyon. It transformed geologic thinking by showing dramatically how geologic features form quickly. It even illustrates how animals could have repopulated the earth after the flood. That was around Mount St. Helens. Right. The landscape was, was decimated and then uh, elk and all kinds of things moved back in there fairly quickly. Very quickly. When Steve did his training in the 1970s, the idea of uniformitarianism held sway, the belief that geologic processes happen slowly and that the Earth must be millions of years old. But Mouse and Helms helped blast that idea away. Geologists began to see evidence for past catastrophe everywhere. That led to a change in thinking, Steve said. I wish I could go back to my professors and say, I told you so. <laughs> the fact is that geologic features form rapidly and not over millions of years. The geologic evidence is a, in, entirely consistent with the biblical time scale. And now he talks about Grand Canyon a little bit. Grand Canyon is now a creationist icon. That's mm -hmm. not something you hear of very often. Grand Canyon has figured prominently in Steve's geological career. In 1994, he published the creation classic Grand Canyon Monument to Catastrophe. That book came out of guidebooks I produced for the tours we conducted, one of the tours that I was on, right. Steve said. Grand Canyon is supposedly an icon for evolution, but now it's an icon for creation and the flood. Right. 
and then he talks about some evidence, uh, more detailed evidence about nautiloids and nautiloid canyon there in Grand Canyon. He's done some amazing work on this one particular canyon, and he's actually the world's expert in the nautiloids, which are these kind of tapered shell-like creatures, like a squid with a shell, right. more or less. A tapered shell. So he's the world's expert in that. And again, evidence that they were not deposited slowly, but deposited rapidly. We'll just skip right. over that for time. But uh, this next section here on radio dating, radioactive dating research. One of the big obstacles to the idea of a young Earth is radioactive dating. Right. Steve has researched this for many years and found that there are lots of problems with the methods. He said, I don't feel particularly fulfilled by having people say that I debunked radioisotope dating. There is a real science in measuring the amount of radioisotopes, but the age is an interpretation of these amounts. My research so shows it is a faulty interpretation. I've been trying to figure out a real explanation for the radioisotope abundances. I don't think things have been successfully dated by radioisotope methods. This is Dr. Steve Austin saying this. He spent 14 years analyzing radioisotopes in samples from rocks known as the Cardenas basalt deep within Grand Canyon. This is igneous rock. Uh, this igneous rock is considered to be over one billion years old. I was able to date samples from many different locations using different dating methods based on potassium argon and rubidium strontium analysis. The methods gave different ages. How can supposedly infallible methods do that? Right. It's like measuring measuring this desk with a wooden ruler and then measuring it with a plastic ruler and coming up with two different measurements. Right. It doesn't work. Steve has also dated some lava flows from young volcanoes at the top of Grand Canyon. Once again, he used two different methods, rubidium strontium and potassium argon, and again, the dates were different. Right. Even one internationally known researcher on radioisotope dating admitted to Steve that half of the dates from whole rock samples from Grand Canyon are wrong. Steve discovered a very concealed secret about potassium argon dating that further challenges the basic assumptions of the method. From his rock samples, he carefully separated minerals such as uh, pyroxene and olivine, I think I'm saying that right, <laughs> which contain very little potassium and dated these with conventional potassium argon techniques. In one example, Steve selected pyroxene crystals from samples of rock from a new lava dome at Mount St. Helens. The rock was only 11 years old when he collected them, yet the pyroxene gave dates of over 2 million years and more. He also collected rocks from more recent lava flows, and uh, he's, he's done a lot of work with radioisotope dating, and original research, by the way. Right. Collecting samples, dating them, sending them to the same university labs that do the dating, and so on. And, and Again, debunking uh, the idea that creationists don't do original research. That's, or, or don't science. do original research, that's right. Well, Dr. Steve Austin has done a lot of original research, and right. others have as well. The article ends this way. In 1994, Steve, along with five other PhDs from various specialties, uh, from a variety of specialties, published a paper about catastrophic plate tectonics, or CPT, at the International Conference on Creationism in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. CPT was a little controversial at the time, and still is. In the paper, the creation scientists described the flood as a global tectonic event powered by the gravitational pull of the seafloor as it plunges into the Earth's mantle. In their model, the plates moved during the flood catastrophe not at rates of centimeters per year, but at meters per second. The CPT model explains away many of the features, or explains many of the features of the Earth, including the uplift of the mountains at the end of the flood. These were pushed up as a result of plate collision, and again, rapidly. And there's so much evidence for that. Before the paper, Steve said there wasn't really a tectonic model for the Genesis flood. Uh, and, and tectonic activity, it wasn't really talked about that right. much back then. And there, there's, there's so many more interesting things about uh, Steve Austin, and there's, there's many other interviews as well. Lots of information in Creation Magazine. You can sign up for that at creation.com.